Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma abad Rabbi syrah li sadri Wa yassir li amri wa hulil uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the welcome address for this very academic research workshop on this very 25th Professional Students Global Conference which we conduct online. We have many eminent faculties with us in this Zoom platform who will uh, enlighten us with many uh, postgraduate programs and researchers. Are you uh, very fond of good research or are you looking for the scope of researchers in India or are you do you want to know more about the competitive exams that are conducted in India we will have a great insight on these uh, eight aspects of researchers uh, I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Firoz Ali Dr. Abdul Samad Dr. Hashim P.K., Dr. Riaz Charwadi and Dr. Jabir M.V. who have enjoined in this Zoom meeting for, uh, to, uh, to uh, enlighten us with research uh, scope in, in India and across the world. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Jabir M.V. who is a scientist from USA and undergoing post-gradual who is undergoing postdoctoral studies. Uh, thank you and Jazakallah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. wa wa barakatuh. wa It's my uh, immense pleasure to host uh, the uh, expert in our research field. And uh, before uh, getting into the session, I would like to uh, mention the uh, participant uh, here we have an excellent panel where you can ask a lot of questions if you are interested, in, if you are looking for the research as a career. And we have a di a different experts from different uh, subjects, uh, starting from the law and the basic science. And, and I urge you all the participants to keep your questions for the end of the session. We have uh, we uh, allotted the time for the question session, so keep your uh, time and uh, be attentive to our session that will be very informative and before uh, much delay um, uh, i would like to introduce our speakers today we have uh, four speakers and uh, we have uh, they'll be talking uh, 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 the professor Firosali will be talking uh, topic why of research and significance of turning into research fields and professor abdul samad He'll be topic, uh, talking the topic research, uh, scope in the present era and a global perspective. And Dr. Hisham PK will be talking about research and higher study at abroad practical guidelines. And Dr. Riyasuddin and will be talking uh, uh, about the net and the how to uh, the exam net case. Okay, so before. Uh, uh, getting to uh, talk, I would like to in, uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Firoz Ali. He's a legal consultant at Health Sector Transformation Program, Riyadh, and he has a Master of Laws from University of Cambridge to the, uh, in 2002. And after that, he got, he got a doctorate from Duke University, United States, it's a prestigious university in 2014. Also, he's a visiting professor at National Law School of uh, India University, Bangalore. He was the first intellectual property rights chair professor at IIT Madras. He's the author of three books on patent law. He's the founder of uh, Tech Grapher, a platform for managing intellectual property. So there are a lot of uh, achievements he, he has, but I don't have enough time to uh, introduce much here. But uh, it's my great pleasure to invite, uh, welcome you to present your talk. Uh, now the floor is yours, uh, Professor Kurosali. Thank you so much, Dr. Jabir, for the nice introduction. And uh, as you had rightly pointed out, I'm here to speak about the why of research, not about how to do research, how to have a career in the research. And I found this because one, um, I'm distinct in this field in the sense that I come from the social science background. I don't come from the scientific background. And more importantly, I am here to say 
uh, or add a few words about why the best minds in our community and in our country should be focusing on research and 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 the premise in which i start my speech is the fact that the best minds right now are not focused on research that's a premise it is something which you can dispute but but i would still hold on to this premise as the foundation of my speech to say that the best minds in our community and in our country are not focused on a career in research now with that let me just give a broad overview of what research is and what kind of activity is a research activity a research activity is a highly creative activity and it involves a field in it involves a domain and it eventually leads to the creation of new knowledge and new knowledge is what innovation is based on it is what progress is based on and new knowledge is what contributes to solving the pressing problems of mankind so i would i would first emphasize that when we talk about research we are largely looking at research and development what we call r and d which is largely research in the scientific sector but you could also extend the principles of what i'm going to discuss in other social science fields as well because regardless of what the field is whether it's a scientific or a non scientific field research results in the creation of new knowledge and most of us who have graduated from universities we all know that universities largely perform two functions they broadly perform what is called the teaching function which is teaching students of the knowledge that is already there which is dissemination dissemination of existing knowledge and the other function which universities recently acquired was the research function and in research function it's completely different and as researchers we know that uh, people who excel in teaching are not the ones who excel in research and we know that for 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 a certainty and we find that this new function of the university which is creation of new knowledge came only through research whereas teaching function you were disseminating what you already had but in the research function universities were trying to generate new knowledge and new knowledge was the knowledge which eventually when it became established and when it when the conventions agreed upon and when when the community agreed upon it that new knowledge got into the textbooks and it got into a part of the teaching function so this is how uh, the 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 academic setup as we understand it is set up i mean you can look into the charter or the at establishing any university you will find this you will find that every university has two functions one being the academic function which is the teaching function and the other being the research function teaching function as i said only disseminates what is already there whereas it is the research function that creates new knowledge which eventually changes the paradigms in any field and it eventually leads textbooks to be rewritten now when i say that when i emphasize on the importance of research and this is something which we had seen in the last one year uh, we are still going through a pandemic and in the pandemic we saw that the first responders which were the medical professionals were almost helpless and we have, we have seen many accounts on the helplessness and and the fact that you know they could only respond to the a pandemic respond to the a, a disease but they couldn't do anything to treat them because we didn't have a treatment till the scientists stepped in and they created the vaccine so this is one instance of where and and, and as i said i start this on the premise that the best minds in our country are going towards a service oriented profession be it the medical profession or the engineering profession and they are not the best minds are not inclined to developing new knowledge which happens only in research now with that let me just give you i mean uh, one of the early contributors to the vaccine uh, was this german company called biontech which is um, started by a professor professor ur shahin he started this and professor ur shahin is a uh, is a classic uh, built of what you call a uh, academic researcher and he has guided more than 50 phd students and more importantly he has more than 500 patents to his name so in today's world it is possible it is possible i mean many people think that if you enter into a uh, into a career of research you are going to be completely cut off from reality it's just arms armchair research that you would do and you would not be solving the problems of mankind here especially the biotech companies that we see today actually solve the problems of mankind despite 
getting into high level research now research can be understood in our, when i talk about research i talk about uh, what leads to the creation of new products through technological innovation now this can this is the foundation of any innovation creation of new products through technological innovation and that every innovation starts off as an invention and invention is a vocabulary that is close to me because as an ipr lawyer and a scholar a uh, patent law is the law that is meant for protecting inventions and inventions uh, by definition it has to be new it has to be based on new knowledge so so we have three requirements of an invention one that it has to be novel in the sense that it is original others have not done it and this is true you can see a parallel between what the requirements of patent law asks a person to deliver and the requirements of research in fact there are some papers written on how research is very similar to the norms in patent law so the research has to be original and this you find it if you want to get a paper published in a peer reviewed journal you will not simply get a publication unless it is original so the originality is the first requirement both for research and for patent law the second thing is that the research or or the product the new product should not be predictable in patent law we call it it is it should not be obvious to another person in your field now this is again true something that is obvious will not be published by the community scientific community because a peer reviewer will say that this is an obvious result there is nothing to report and the third requirement for an invention which is also true for research is the fact that it should have utility it should be useful now this we know that a research that gets publication are largely the research that is going to be useful for the mankind now from this we understand that there is a close relationship between the way in which inventions come up and the way in which research gets published and disseminated and the underlying criteria for both being that you contribute by creating new knowledge now research can further be classified into basic research and applied research and basic research is largely science for the sake of science you just do generalized you don't have a specific goal rather you have a generalized goal and basic research often happens in what we call frontier technology like uh, gene uh, genetic engineering and ai artificial intelligence frontier technology normally starts off with generalized research but then when there is a particular problem that needs to be addressed that is where the lessons learned in the basic research is now applied and this is what we call applied research now whether it is a career in basic research or whether it is a career in applied research the key to a researcher or the key for a researcher to succeed is creativity a researcher needs to be creative and a research job is a highly creative job and i would argue that there is no other job which is so demanding when it comes to creativity as a research job and the reason i say that is for three reasons now now there are some agreed upon definitions on creativity but i would like to quote the definition from the book creativity the book is titled creativity the flow and psychology of discovery and invention this is a book written by a renowned uh, renowned uh, scientist and uh, and uh, behavioral scientist uh, mikhaili sitsen mikhaili now he says that there are three components to creativity for you to say that your work is creative or your outcome is creative there has to be three components if there is if these three components are not there then probably there won't be a consensus on the work being a creative one now many of us uh, we, th- there are people amongst us who can write poetry there are people amongst us who can paint well there are people amongst us who can do innovative work research work but unless these three components are there your work the world will not recognize your work to be creative now what are those three components the first component is a creative endeavor is an endeavor that results from the interrelationship in a system which is made up of three parts so it's a interrelationship within a system of three integral parts the first part is that the system should have a domain when we say a domain we refer to a set of symbolic rules and procedures say the domain of math- mathematics the domain of physics or even it could be a sub domain could also qualify for a domain in itself for instance algebra can itself qualify itself as a domain so you have a domain 
and you operate within that domain. And what is the domain? A domain is a set of symbolic rules and procedures which the entire community is in agreement on. There's no dispute or disagreement with regard to what are those rules and procedures. So first thing, to be creative, you need to be operating in a domain. And, and all the pseudosciences will not fall into a domain because there is no set of rules and procedures which the entire community has agreed upon. The second thing is the requirement of a field. Now, uh, now, now, Mikhali distinguishes a field as something that includes all the participants, all the individuals who act as gatekeepers to the domain. So, first you have the domain, which is the, which is the, uh, which is the knowledge. Then you have gatekeepers, which are nothing but humans, individuals who are now guarding the domain. Now, the gatekeeper example, will you will understand what the field is if you want to publish a paper in nature or in, uh, or, or in science. It will be simply difficult for anybody to get a publication unless it is being peer reviewed by the people whom we call the field. So the domain is actually guarded by the field and field is nothing but your peers in the, in, in, in the particular chosen domain who now recognize your work, who will now peer review your work. And the third thing required for a, a creative contribution to be made or, or as a requirement of creativity is the individual person himself. The individual makes a contribution, even if it's a team of many individuals, still there is an individual contribution which together makes a contribution. So the individual has to make a contribution. Now, what kind of contribution will be qualified as a creative contribution or what amounts to creativity? Now, the individual using the symbols of the domain, which is a set of rules and procedures within the domain, comes up with a new idea or a new knowledge, which is novel. Now, this is creativity for you. you so what, what, what does that tell us? It tells us that even if you are an individual, for you to be creative, the new idea or the new knowledge that you come up with, one should satisfy the rules and procedures of an established domain. If you're not operating in an established domain, and thankfully, if you look at all the engineering colleges or the universities, there are established domains with fields of knowledge there. Let it be aeronautics, let it be mechanical, chemical, all, all the departments that you find are actually the domains. And, and it's interesting to see that the patent office, which is the one which grants patents over inventions, also has similar domains there. You have biotechnology there, pharmaceuticals there, you have chemical, you have mechanical, similar domains are there who, who inspect inventions based on which domain it is. And they also do the function of a peer reviewer, roughly. So for an individual's contribution to be regarded as a creative contribution, you need to have a domain in which you operate, and you need to have gatekeepers who are in the field, what we call the field, who will now recognize your contribution and certify and approve your contribution as an original contribution. Unless it is peer reviewed and approved it, you simply don't make a mark. And thankfully, the domain of science is not a domain where free speech is allowed. You and I, who are not qualified, will simply not be able to make a publication in any major scientific journal for the simple reason, whatever we say, one may not conform to the rules of the domain because we are not qualified, we have not gone through the rigor of the domain. Two, even if we know that or we have done some self-study, still the peers in that the gatekeepers will not approve it unless we subscribe to the, the, to the existing uh, rules and procedures of the domain. So this tells us that in any branch of science, you have a set of rules and procedures, you have a set of gatekeepers, and then you have the innovator or the inventor who makes the contribution. Now, I will quickly take you through a seminal contribution that happened recently, and, and India was privy to it because uh, the patent by the company called Novartis, which related to a cure for cancer, chronic myeloid leukemia, the, the name of the drug is Gleevec, actually went through this process. Now, I'll just 
it's it's a long story but whoever is interested can see the uh, the story of gleevec it's nicely captured in a nature article you will find all these three things there the first we did not find the cure to cancer without finding the reason for the cancer itself so you had in the 1960s a group of scientists identifying a chromosome and or an aberration in a chromosome which they named it as the philadelphia chromosome because it was discovered in philadelphia they found that uh, uh, the, the the two scientists novel and hungerford they found that there were some abnormalities in the structure of the 22 chromosome chromosome number 22 they found that one of the arms of chromosome number 22 was actually fused with an arm from chromosome 9 so it was an aberration and they discovered that this it was this chromosome this aberration in the chromosome was actually a consequence of the disease and not for the cause so they just identified the chromosome and they identified this as a consequence that knowledge came later now this was in the 1960s somewhere in the 1980s there another group of scientists they were able to come up with better dyeing techniques they were able to actually see the chromosome in action at the mechanism of how it worked and they were also able to see how that aberration took place and finally they identified a protein which was causing this aberration and the protein led uh, the the cells to multiply immensely and create white blood cells immature white blood cells and we know that that's the reason for any cancer leukemia especially now all these things were not done by one team or one by scientists but it was a group of scientists they all worked in a domain and they all had a, they they peer reviewed each other's work and finally in 1990 after they identified the function of the fusion gene and they found that this led to the production of an abnormal protein which triggered the cells to divide only then that is after 30 years of this discovery which is largely a basic research where they able to find and isolate one protein the production of one protein and to isolate and see how they could mutate uh, how how they could mute the production of that particular protein now after 30 years of research there was a drug that was developed and and the story goes that uh, a researcher in us approached all the companies that were into uh, a similar research where you could suppress the activity of a protein very few companies were doing it and they found a candidate from siba gaigi which later on became was acquired and became novartis and this drug could do the job of uh, of restricting the activity of the aberrant, uh, aberrant protein or the deviant protein now again you will find that it is individual contributions of creativity who operated in a domain and who were recognized by their peers which took a long time and and long lead time is a hallmark for scientific research many a times you know th- there is a long lead time between the discovery of a scientific principle and manifestation of an actual product now uh, the the right brothers flight actually took off there was a long uh, research that happened on aerodynamics and you know air, air engineering and only then the first flight could fly similarly if you look at your xerox machine uh, the the research on photoelectricity and other related technologies happened years before the first manifestation of the xerox machine came which is somewhere in 1960s so there is a long lead time and the long lead time tells us that creativity within this domain takes time and creativity also is something that will be that has to be recognized by the peers now coming back to 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 the present time now we will know that uh we have seen creativity expand in a rapid pace during the time of covid and 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 we have seen that there have been more than uh 20 or 25 uh, attempts to create vaccines some of them which have resulted in 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 a great success and we also see that you know uh, uh, companies which began its work just as early as jan 2020 were able to deliver the vaccine in a very short time now this has happened and 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 all credit goes to uh, all credit goes to the uh, scientists who have worked in different parts of the world this has happened because we had a domain that was recognized and we had peer reviewers or 
or gatekeepers within the domain who allowed this to progress in such a quick fashion. So the point that I want to make at the end of this is to say that research or creativity is the act of creating new knowledge that changes an existing domain or transforms one domain into another new domain. And this creation of new knowledge is what contributes to the progress of the society and for solving the problems that face the society. So with that, I would just want to conclude to say that I'm running quickly out of my time uh, to say that when you invest in a career in research, when you invest in a career in in, in academic research. And academic research is a part of R&D because many a times you have to go through the rigor of an academic research even to contribute. And, and as, I, uh, as I suggested, the instance of Professor uh, Shahin, uh, today's academic researcher could also be a person who solves the problems of mankind. Uh, knowledge can only be created. New knowledge can only be created in research. And when you involve in research, you get a place on the table in which new knowledge is decided. And that's very important for any country, for any community, that you get a stake in the creation of new knowledge. And, and there is nothing more that you need to do if you want to contribute to nation building and to solving the problems of, um, of, of mankind, as we have seen in the last uh, few months. That is not to belittle the, doc the work the doctors have done, not at all. I mean, we cannot do that. But to say that sometimes you can only be a firefighter if you are in the service industry, you cannot create new knowledge. You are largely, you are largely using the knowledge that has already been created. Whereas creation of new knowledge, as we saw, the creation of the vaccine, does not come from the medical profession at all. It, it actually comes from the researchers within the medical profession, but it comes from a different people who do not, uh, who are not the frontline workers in in as we have seen during the pandemic. So just to come back to my point that. Um, um, I, I, I take the view, and I started with this point, that research is the activity for which the best minds in our country and in our community should be focused on. And, and the COVID pandemic has just thrown a uh, new light on the importance of research and how quickly we can develop uh, vaccines which are effective. With that, I will conclude. And if there are any questions, I can take it now. Or if you are planning for a panel discussion, I can also join that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ferrosali. It was really educative and informative. Even for me, uh, a lot of things you said, it's really a new thing. I mean, new uh, look into the research. It's, uh, the research skill is the only place we can create the knowledge. It's, it's true. I mean, and none of other field where we follow the people who already created the knowledge, we just follow them and just do what the service uh, style of uh, work. But the research where we can uh, really... Dr. Dr. Jabir, there is some disturbance yeah. from your mic. Maybe you should come closer. S small oh, really? Okay. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Thank you for pointing out me. Uh, how, how about now? Yeah, it's clearer. Better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if any of the participants have a question, you can ask now or you can drop the question in the chat box, or you can keep it at the end of the session where we have a more discussion. Uh, let's see if have anyone have, has any question. And if not, maybe I, I can ask a very quick question on this yeah. one, since you mentioned, <laughs> mentioned about the patent and the paper publication. Yeah. So which one would be more beneficial to the society, the peer-reviewed journal publications or the patent? Because I see the patent as the, more the what do you call the money i mean economic i mean people want yeah. to make money so they make it patent so yeah. which one we should uh, look for yeah. it i mean it's kind of a dilemma yeah, there. yeah, yeah. excellent question excellent question now yeah. now there is some research as as you would all know there is some research which simply cannot be patented very very general research like e is equal to mc squared you simply can't patent it the law does not allow you to do that one because it's basic scientific knowledge and equations mathematical equations all these things cannot be patented so patenting would cover the applied part of research but but today the line between basic and applied can quickly dis diminish i mean so we we understand that so what we advise i mean uh, as as uh, the a first IPR chair professor, I did meet many of my colleagues, Professor uh, Abdul Samad is also there uh, with us now. Now, uh, many of my colleagues who had this um, uh, this dilemma, 
should I publish or should I patent? So our standard response has been this. If there is something of commercial utility that you see, economic significance in the future, it not be immediate, it can be in the future, we would first ask them to file an application because an application, patent application, if it is filed, it is kept in abeyance, unpublished for at least 18 months. In the meantime, you quickly go ahead with your publication, expedite it, whatever, so that the publication happens after you file the application. So, so this is a technique which many people are employing. In fact, if you, uh, I, I just mentioned that uh, Dr. Shahin is, uh, Professor Shahin is, uh, uh, owns 500 patents and he has got quite a lot of publications as well. So this is how they do it. A patent can be filed at a very early stage in research when there is some promise. When there is some promise, it's very early stage, you can file a patent and it costs nothing. I mean, today it can be done online and you're just protecting the terrain. And later on, assume that you file a patent and after one year you find that, oh, this was a, a wrong lead. You don't want to go that way. You can just abandon the patent for nothing. So, so what we advise, because the other option is not an option at all. Once you publish it in a scientific journal, you cannot patent it because you are disclosing the knowledge and patent law requires the knowledge to be kept secretive. And the first disclosure has to be made to the patent office and not to the uh, peer review community or any journal that you are publishing. Some countries, especially the US, has a grace period. The grace period is you can publish whatever you want and within 12 months, you can follow it up with a patent application. In India, we do have a grace period, but the law is not certain. So we don't normally advise people on the grace period because there are some notifications that has to come into effect before it can kick in and it can operate the way it operates today in the United States. So, so our fundamental, the bottom line is that if you anticipate or if you expect some economic benefit out of your research, first file an application, then go for your scientific publication. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll come back to you. I don't see any question in the chat box. Probably people are keeping it before the end of the session. So yeah. we'll go for the next session. Sure. Uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Abdul Samad. Uh, he's a professor from IIT Madras. And he obtained his uh, B.Tech and M.Tech in mechanical engineering from Aligarh Muslim University and PhD from Ina University, South Korea. And he also has extensive uh, research career, I mean, achievements in, during his research career. Uh, his, his research interests include marine energy, food uh, machinery, and optimization. And also he received a national award from the Institution of Engineers in 2014, and the Young Scientist Award from uh, MTSC Kerala in 2016. Also, he was, elect he's a, was elected fellows of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. It's a prestigious society and was a visiting professor at the University of Hawaii at Manau and the Seoul National University. So with this, I welcome uh, Ab Professor Abdul Samad to deliver his topic, uh, Research Scope in the Present Era, a Global Perspective. Welcome, Abdul Samad. Assalamualaikum, brother. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My voice is clear, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You okay. can go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, brother. So uh, I'll uh, start speaking on general aspect of research present uh, area situation and global perspective and what are the future prospects for Indian students or in India as well as in global. So everything I'll be making very short. So in research, we say like after graduation, students think that they know everything. After master's, they think still we need to know something. But after PhD, they think I know nothing. Uh, because research is so much rigorous study, so that the feeling will come like I know nothing. Because you, you will have knowledge of in-depth knowledge in one specific area that will explore your uh, knowledge capability. I mean, knowledge is uh, gaining capability. And you will feel that I need to know more. So that feeling will give, I know nothing, that feeling will come. So till you uh, feel that uh, I know nothing, <laughs> that term, <laughs> you're not a good researcher. <laughs> so the students who are doing PhD, they'll be knowing that. And when you're doing research, so pure science, social science, they have some different domain or research area. And engineering sciences, they are also having different domain area. So pure science and social science, their job prospect, especially if I see, 
basically academic area and these days many companies even government organization also are opening up for uh, industry or other jobs for research phd holders in engineering sciences research holders like phd degree or masters degree holders they get job in industry also uh, many industry for example uh, many big industry say biotech they will be hiring maybe for sales job phd holder so that is also possible uh, but normally social science normally academic area is uh, pre- uh, that, that academic uh, area is open for them but other area also they can choose and yeah so next is three types of research in science technology academic research research laboratory and industry in academic research normally like for example i am teaching in iim madras so i am doing research so our research will be more fundamental basic so we invent like professor jaleen like we invent and the invention should see some real prototype some small level laboratory test then that will go to larger level test then it will go to industry so as an academic people normally we do research in the basic level we generate idea we file patent we do some work uh, to laboratory development but pushing to industry we try continuously sometimes it fails sometimes it works but without the basic research the world cannot move so that basic research part we do in academic area research laboratory research laboratory like in india we have csir cent- uh, csir and like bhava atomic research center and many other research centers are there those research centers will take the basic research to certain level towards industrial production or say drdo defense research development uh, uh, the ministry of defense laboratory will be developing like some tank or zone tank so they will be taking some basic knowledge they will be developing up to certain level and they will be handing over to industry sometime they will be producing also but normally they will be working in between academic research and industry but if i say industrial research industry is more application oriented where money can be generated in academic research we do not think about money whether it will be generated or not but if we find that it is our my research is generating some money some industry has taken up it will very good real life application is there many research we do which may not have money generation capability for example some particle uh, physics pure science people will be finding some particle uh, or social science people will find some prehistoric slime in saudi arabia so that may not give money or industrial uh, but industry if someone is working in the industry they will not fund for them so industry will think about money generation commercialization so industry will take those research which are having more potential for money generation business growth so whenever we are doing research there are three types there academic research laboratory industry so we always try to academic as an academic people we always try to collaborate with research laboratory or industry okay uh now social sciences research i already told so they are more academic in nature their research may not be monetized or commercialized immediately but they will have value in lots of aspect for example historical development what was the prehistoric uh, social system what we are doing now whether that can be linked somewhere so that sort of thing they will be finding and among all these researches lots of inventions are going on which are more disrupt in nature for example one disruption can be ola cab previously a uh, cab calling a uh, taxi or chennai auto you have to call them they will come sometimes they will be cheating also they will say okay 100 rupees when you get down there is no sir 150 rupees now the disruptive technology mobile based technology came up ola cab so they change all the concept of cab booking and the disruptive technology change like camera everyone previously even like 10 years 15 years back people were used to buy camera now they are not buying camera they are buying mobile phone and that destroyed one company kodak kodak got destroyed so the disruptive technologies are coming up and they are changing the old old technological scenario social scenario so the new research the students or the learner they will be learning new thing new technology which will be changing the social order technological order they will be changing the world policy systems the covid already professor um, khan has given uh, in uh, example that covid within one year changed the world 
and the vaccination is within one year people have done it so next i'll talk about uh, they say covid will go after that what will happen what happened in our research electronics industry you have seen so much change now students my son is using computer mobile previously before lockdown we are not used to give him so much electronic item but now we are compulsory to give school teachers are giving task homework everything in electronic system so communication electronic system revision has uh, already started forward for vaccine came up that is fine but with the tech less medicine possible like without uh, without a needle in injection possible what will happen to our business work from home we learned whether after 5 years 10 years what will happen to our business so what sort of research what can we predict so that that is also a big research area actually papers books already i am teaching without books and papers and my students are getting notes just i am uploading and when they will be coming back to iit or any engineering colleges or medical colleges or uh, general bbc courses when they will be coming to college whether they will be using books or they will be using soft copies so systems are changing soft copies is, if they are coming then how how much secure how much knowledge they are getting so what technology they should use was so, mit degree can we get from my home already so there course there are many other degrees uh, many other systems are there where uh, anyone can learn from let's say remote area from northeast or bihar or west bengal or anyway learning is easier microsoft job from a village in india is also possible our kids after 20 years whether 25g network will come or 26g we don't know but what is progressing so our technology will be progressing so our research also will be uh, our indian research or in general research the new scientists they will be learning they will be implementing research will go on so 25g network is coming then what will happen in the whole social system okay uh what will be the, what will happen to our laptops computers mobiles or spaces gigabyte megabyte terabyte tera terabyte or what e vehicles are coming i went to germany in, uh, in 2019 december so uh, so they are doing very uh, very high level research in e vehicle generation so they don't want uh, petrol operated vehicles on the roads so uh, they are investing a lot so what happen if we implement that system in india and how the social adaptivity will be there whether after 20 30 years helicopter will be there in every home in india or a pilot for mars what will be the social order language because translators are coming electronic translators cultures so because of electronic system cultures are changing if you see all everyone is having mobile knowledge knowledge system is in your hand previously uh, to get one book or any paper i was in aligarh uh, i was studying during my masters program uh so to get few uh, uh, aligarh muslim university has lots of books and papers in their library but few specific paper if i want to get i have to go to iit delhi i have to get letter from our department then i have to show to iit delhi librarian they will be giving permission then we can get some books or papers now that is not required we are teaching from home we are getting all the papers books everything so the social system changing everything changing so when systems are changing researchers those people are there they will be linking between previous to future so they will give that idea how to link okay the system changing society changing so how to link so researcher will be formulating things okay they will formulate technology they will they will be formulating the uh, social order how how to look like in future uh in india if you see from 1947 uh, engineering college were 50 and university were 20 and uh, now around 900 universities iit started 1950s now more than 20 i think universities produce phd's in all areas but iit initially it was recorded as undergraduate school now we are producing more phd holders more research we are doing indian science now we have reached to uh, reach to uh, moon right covid vaccine also india is a pioneer in producing so we are pro- we are in the forefront so our new generation our community our citizens they will be learning new sort of techniques they will produce more creativity the creative item through their creativities so that research creativity innovation that will go on that must go on so when 
if you are thinking about your future goal they say after engineering whatever you are doing actually you will be like closing valve opening valve but after mass masters you may be will be given some innovative work but after research if you go to any industry any company you will be given task where you have to think you have to innovate you have to find new idea new knowledge but that new idea new knowledge you cannot expect from undergraduate level candidates undergraduate level candidates who are having btech or bsc degree or ba degree so we can expect that high level thinking uh, from research student research scholars so that will come from our highly talented students and scholars and what we need when we are interviewing a candidate for phd or masters program masters normally we don't have interview we have gate gate get through gate you can enter uh, into iit mtech ms and phd program we take interview so in that case we try to check subject knowledge okay so if you have good subject knowledge then we train them so what i do if some student coming from some normal college they have publication also when they are joining me i say they forget everything start from zero because i want to train them how to innovate how to get new knowledge how to innovate how to think differently so in that way they can publish more they can innovate more they can file patent they can their product or their concept will be moving towards industry or practical application so that will create a pathway impact so if we are doing research without impact so there is no value final value will be zero but if we create a pathway impact what will happen to our research after 5 years after 10 years then that maybe immediately we may not have any impact in of our research but after 5 years or 10 years some company or some uh, some industry or some researcher or some laboratory in the world they will be appreciating they will be using our thought so then the research is successful actually so thank you very much uh, so anyone have any question they can ask now or maybe later so jabir please yeah thank you so much uh... uh i am not sure uh, i don't see any question in the chat box uh, maybe we can uh keep it at the end of the session since uh we are a little off from the time schedule so let first let's finish the rest of the talk then maybe we can have a uh, uh, full fledged discussion here our next speaker is dr hashim pk uh, he's a research department uh he's a researcher at department of chemistry and biotechnology the university of tokyo Uh, he obtained his MSc in chemistry from Aligarh Muslim University and a PhD in biological science from Hokkaido University in Japan. And his research area is DNA origami nanostructures via template polymerization and also biomolecular machine immobilized nanoparticles and cluster for ATP triggered robotics application. And he has a, a number of publications in reputed journals. uh he will be uh talking about the research and high study at abroad uh, practical guidelines and with this i welcome uh, dr hisham pk to deliver his talk thank you assalamu alaikum warahmatullah i hope my sound is clear yeah wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh you can go ahead yeah. sure bismillahir rahmanir rahim shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul luqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli and thank you very much for inviting me for this beautiful workshop and i think it's indeed relevant for the present youth to have a proper guidance and a direction to build their career so as he mentioned like probably i will yeah so following the previous speaker's line i would briefly talk about the purpose of education and then what is research and with some practical uh, outlook So in my opinion purpose of education can be divided from an islamic perspective as well as a worldly or academic perspective of course any kind of knowledge for an islamic belief perspective to better understand the greatness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also to become a good human who practices islam along with whatever work or whatever things he is doing in his life and from academic perspective of course the acquiring knowledge is to make a proper living with moral values with creativity and productivity in a society it also include to build a career path that bring money and social status and also to understand unknown things and discover new things in science and technology so point i wanted to emphasize here actually the purpose of education 
the meaning of purpose of education from the worldly perspective actually include in the Islamic perspective as well, which means a Muslim supposed to have all the worldly perspective of education. Along with that, he may better understand the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just to recap, after having a high school, you may be now in undergrad level. And then after that, you may can go for a master degree and after that, a PhD degree. So what should be our motivation? As a human being or as a believer, every student should have a, a, a broader perspective of knowledge, not just in school study, not just from an undergrad degree and after that going to an industry or secure life. No, we should, we should be motivated ourselves to have a broader perspective to, to learn knowledge, not just to acquire the livelihood, but to learn knowledge. What is higher study? It simply means study high. Whatever your interest is, let it be a science, let it be a social science, let it be a technology, computer, or like modern technologies like artificial intelligence or genetic engineering, etc. Whatever your interest is, you need to have, you need to be motivated to go further and study high. Of course, the extreme of a higher study is a PhD course. PhD course simply an academic course, just like a master degree or just like an undergrad. The only difference is in PhD course, those who are doing that, they will un- investigate in depth to certain field of their interest and that are not yet to human beings. And throughout that investigation as, as a out- outcome of that re- investigation, certain new knowledge will come. That new knowledge can be beneficial to the human being very soon or in the in the far future. So, what is a research and a, what a scientist do? Research is a systematic investigation of scientific or social theories and an hypothesis. What is hypothesis? Hypothesis is a proposed explanation of something based on available knowledge for something yet to be explained by experiments. And the people who create such hypotheses are researchers. Researchers try to answer many questions we have about how the world works. So research has certain methodology. The scientific ha- scientist, whether it's a social science or a conventional science, they have certain methodology to look into their, their, their hypothesis. So first they look around or the existing knowledge that is called observation. And then they ask question, inside this observation or inside this existing knowledge, what is missing? And if I clarify that point, what can bring in new into that field? Based on that question, the scientists hypothesis. They make hypothesize, and then they do certain experiment. The experiment is not only in in a science related subject, but also in social related subject. And then the experiment results they will analyze based on the many, techn- many technologies or many experimental methods that can be sometimes very costly instrument. And then they make some conclusion. So most researchers work for companies or academic institution after they having certain uh, research outcomes, then they can decide themselves whether to go or to continue their research in an academic setup or in a company setup. And many of them have a PhD in an appropriate field. Those who are going through the academic one or into the company, they will have a relevant PhD. For instance, a person who is contacting certain uh, direct related one, they may have a PhD in pharmaceutical science or in a chemistry related subject. So in brief, what can be the scientific method? As I mentioned, do some observation, or do an existing knowledge analysis, like in literature search, and then make an hypothesis, and then do some experiment, then collect data, and make some conclusion out of this collect data from the experiment, and share the results as the first speaker mentioned about this publishing or patenting, etc. And then inform or translate this results into the practical application. So every researchers of any part, any branch of science or social science, they do this methodology to to invent something new. 
So what can be the typical pathway to become a researcher after having university undergraduate course and then go for a master PG and sometime in India we have an MPhil and then you can go to PhD and after PhD you do certain again this kind of a job you can say postdoctoral or post PhD research activity and then the individual decide to go to the company or to the university so what's important here in the undergrad level most of the people most of the students decide their stream like in a conventional science or in a pharmaceutical science or in engineering stream or in a social science related stream or in a medical field etc and when it goes to the master level your interest or your subject is more focused now for instance if you are a, a chemistry background you study a lot of different chemistry in undergrad but in goes to the pg level master level now your, your your topic in chemistry are more narrow and then you are actually deeping into more narrow in an mphil or phd level then you find out something very big and from that narrow that is not yet known to that field so what you should have in this is like extra knowledge or extra experience not just from the textbook activities but outside text activities that can be a internship based or research experience and some of this institute in india they offer winter or summer related course or short term courses or company visit or research lab visit this kind of things need to be acquired so that that will you know explore yourself to be a new a new academic or new world of knowledge and i just would like to share my my own research pathway like i graduated from from federal college and then did a master from aligarh and then came to japan for my phd course and then came to tokyo university for post doctoral research and then now i'm working in uh, tokyo university as a researcher so what made me in this is i had an extra uh, a, a chance to allow uh, to to go to the iict hyderabad during after my or during my pg course to get an extra research experience so that actually uh, helped me to get here so otherwise you know it's very difficult because we are competing the people who are going from one country to the other country are competing with the students in that country so i i want to sh- mention here india now is actually coming up as the previous uh, speaker mentioned in india we actually have uh, most of the uh, higher level research facilities and recently a good research are coming out like iits or uh, isos or indian academy of science bangalore etc this kind of things are actually providing very good educations and uh, some of these recent programs is focusing much based on the research so in india if you want you can get the very quality education very quality research however coming to the abroad or going to the abroad for have certain opportunities globalization is now a keyword for everyone every country welcomes uh, students from other countries to make more global and what makes different in other country is is a different way of acquiring education india has certain a stream of uh, education the straight and way of presenting the uh, teaching or acquiring knowledge in other country like japan or other asian countries like china or korea has, they have certain different way so we are actually uh, trying to mix one way to the other way that's one good opportunity is when you go abroad you can have a a different way of acquiring knowledge and these programs are often supported by the government scholarship if you're able to get it uh, it's absolutely no expenditure from your side you can even go to the different countries with zero money with flight ticket uh, reserved and master course in most of the countries like in japan are more research oriented you have very less to study and more to do on research and you can also become an ambassador of your country or if you're interested in doing uh, dharma activities you can also do that in, in religion uh, in if you go to the other countries of course this come with the challenges it's multicultural so you will have a lot of limitations like 
lifestyle, including uh, food, can be very a very different style. And if you're not able to get the government scholarship, then you have to pay the tuition fees. And that also uh, troubles some if you don't find a suit, uh, proper part-time job. And you need certain credits or research achievement to graduate. And uh, if you're more uh, serious in practicing Islam, then with very limited facilities, very limited Muslim communities. However, if you have a proper base in Islam, then uh, I think that won't make any problem. Now, like what can be uh, the practical steps to begin with if you're interested in uh, the abroad studies? First of all, as I mentioned, have a good ambition to earn a university degree abroad and consult with someone who can guide you. Obviously, this should not be with the recruiting agencies they, because they, they will have certain agenda from their self. So you need to find someone who, who can guide you and properly and they look for necessary criteria. Each universities in each countries have uh, their own criteria that include the English criteria like IELTS or GRE. And you don't need to fix a country to go, rather fix an interesting subject or in, a interesting area. And then you find this subject is, where is the best in, in the world, something like. And most importantly, try to get the extracurricular activities during your uh, present whatever education you are doing now, whether it's undergrad or even in senior high school, like plus two or in your master level, always try to have the extra activities that will help you when you apply for abroad universities. And this is also important to have as proper application, which is very important to write many things in the application. The application most of the time will not be a plain paper, rather you need to write creatively uh, based on your uh, experience. They also need a lot of advice, I think. And uh, I think the financial issue should not be the first barrier. If you have proper ambition and a proper guidance, uh, the finance will come in because many are uh, giving the scholarship, I think that won't make any problem. And then uh, if you apply for the scholarship program, they have multiple interviews. And if it succeeds, then you don't have any ex expenditure. Even if you don't have scholarship, after going to the specific universities, the universities also offer uh, scholarships or private program, or even if you can do part-time work and uh, do along with the studies. So it, it simply uh, don't think that finance is a big issue, rather, make your ambition proper and get the proper guideline and get the application properly. And then inshallah, you will, uh, you will get the opportunities. And with this, uh, let me conclude by, by once again, thanking the organizers for uh, sharing my uh, little experience. And I would be happy to help any, anyone of you if you have any, uh, if you need any proper uh, consultation an hour or later, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. P.K. Uh We have a question here. I think maybe we can address at the end of the session because uh, we are a little off from the time. So I think after the uh, next session, we, maybe you can uh, address this question, inshallah. Uh, so with this, uh, we will move to the next session. Uh, the next the next speaker is Dr. Riyasuddin N. He is an uh, assist, uh, assistant professor in chemistry at WMO Imam Ghazali Arts and Science College in Why Not. Uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Busan National University, South Korea, uh, till uh, August uh, till uh, 2020. And recently he joined as an assistant professor in uh, uh, WMO College. And he's a PhD holder from the Nike Calicut in uh, 2015. And he has published a number of papers in international reputed journals. Also, he, he uh, is a co-author of a book chapter in the field of uh, polymer science. And uh, he'll be talking in Research in India Guidelines for NetGate and Scholarship, etc. Uh, so with this, I welcome Dr. Riyasuddin to deliver his talk. Actually, I need to talk about the research in India and uh, guidelines for the net and uh, gate. Uh, while talking about the research in India, we need to uh, discuss the current scenario. Uh, we are in, uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there are many researchers uh, going on uh, across the globe uh, uh, about this uh, COVID-19. 
there are many uh, astonishing uh, publications already uh, have published in this uh, related to the COVID-19, about 80, more than 80, 7,000 research publications already came. And in this field also, India also contributed about less, less than 7 percentage of uh, related uh, work. And just before this uh, COVID-19, India was much uh, um, behind the scene, uh, especially in the uh, virus related research, so less than 3.7, maybe like that. And uh, let me take you uh, to a little bit uh, our history in the academic research in India. Actually, if we uh, uh, look into the, uh, our history in the academic research, um, we will find the Asiatic Society in Bengal, Kolkata, which is established in, in uh, 1784 by uh, Sir William Jones. And uh, they have to, uh, made effort to uh, do research in the Oriental subjects, and including they have done uh, researches in the uh, geography and geology botany, geology, etc. And in that figure, as a result, maybe uh, in 1902, uh, Ronald Ross has won the uh, Nobel Prize and from outside, but he has done his uh, research in India uh, related to the life cycle of the uh, parasite, uh, malarial parasite. And later on, in 1976, uh, after the uh, establishment of Indian Association for the Cultivation of science. Uh, there was much effort has been made, uh, including, uh, as we know, uh, uh, C. V. Raman. Uh, he was uh, he has worked in association with this uh, uh, IACS, and uh, he has uh, developed the Raman effect, and he has got the first Nobel Prize uh, for science for a nation first time. So uh, later on, there were many effort. Uh, has been done in that period uh, in the field of academic research. We need to uh, mention some names, uh, including um, uh, J.C. Bose and Dr. Lechandra Ray and uh, Professor Satyendra Bose. Uh, he has developed the Bose Einstein statistics. Uh, Bose, Bosons are named after, after him. So anyway, in that period, uh, just before the uh, independence, it was very good, fruitful age. And even after the independence, uh, we have done many researches uh, in the field of uh, crop development and space program and nuclear research, uh, etc. And if we come to the current, current scenario, uh, I think uh, uh, if, we, if we look into the uh, you know, world ranking of universities, we are a little bit, little bit behind the scene. Um, if we uh, take first 100 universities in the world, it's no university from India. But uh, there are a few universities below uh, 400 and ISE like that and IIT like two, and uh, some in the uh, top universities. Anyway, uh, we need to uh, uh, put much effort in this area of research. Basically, uh, uh, if we talk about the academic research, PhD is, uh, is the uh, basic of uh, research, right? Uh, even though we are doing uh, research in the master's uh, or uh, graduate degree, uh, PhD is, is the actual base. So uh, if we uh, go for a PhD, uh, PhD uh, it's, nowadays it is must and mandatory to get a, a very good job as a lecturer or uh, assistant professor. And PhD, uh, normally we are doing PhD uh, as uh, part-time or full-time. But always uh, uh, CSAR and our MHRD always uh, recommend to do the PhD as a full-time. So we can uh, completely dedicate to the PhD. So normally uh, uh, three years is, uh, is taking for completion of this PhD. Uh, if it is satisfactory, sometimes we can extend the period, of course. And part time will take a minimum uh, means uh, four years is the uh, normal uh, tenure of the uh, PhD, but uh, sometimes it may also extend. If we uh, want to get into PhD position in any university, uh, like universities like IITs, NITs, or ISC, etc. We need to pass a certain entrance examination. Uh, there are uh, certain entrance examinations which are conducted uh, nationally. Uh, 
like uh, CAGE uh, and CSIR net and uh, UGC net, etc. And uh, after clearing this, uh, tracking this uh, and these examinations, there will be uh, some uh, recontests uh, in some universities, and we need to uh, appear for the interview and they will absorb for this between PhD positions. And uh, actually, my uh, topic need to uh, my uh, talk I need to emphasize on the net and uh, gate. So, uh, if we uh, clear the gate, uh, we need to uh, get the admission into uh, universities for pursuing MPEG as well as uh, MS ME programs. And uh, if you have uh, in science net uh, for gate. You can also uh, uh, get admission for the PhD positions, and even uh, you can also uh, produce the uh, your gate certificate for getting job in uh, uh, very good companies, etc. And uh, uh, jobs even in organizations including DRDO, or ISRO, etc. And uh, there is. Also, JRF, you can also get the uh, junior research fellowship if you have very good uh, percentile in the gate examinations. And uh, even uh, there are certain universities outside India uh, also uh, considering the gates for in the in Indian uh, uh, this gate examinations. If you uh, want to apply or uh, appeal for this gate examination, you need to have a uh, graduate degree uh, in India uh, and the bachelor degree uh, technology, engineering and agricultural science, etc. And master's degree uh, in math, uh, mathematics, statistics, computer, uh, science, etc. are also eligible for, the, uh, for appearing in the gate examinations. And those who are uh, 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 doing integrated uh, uh, master's program uh, also appear uh, in gate examination. And uh, there is no age limit. Uh, and it, that's the benefit for gate examination. And, uh, and uh, one can appear many times as he wants. Uh, or many times, he, he can also appear in the gate examination. Normally, the gate ex uh, examinations uh, is uh, uh, conducting for different uh, uh, subject papers, uh, there are more than 20 uh, papers, and uh, there will be uh, questions from the uh, aptitude uh, type questions and the technical and engineering related questions will be there. And it's conducting uh, computer based uh, uh, testing, and uh, uh, one can, uh, there will be 65 questions uh, for 100 marks. And multi it includes multiple choice questions and the numerical answer questions. And uh, there will be uh, some uh, minus mark also. You need to uh, consider that thing also in that I will uh, appear in the gate examination. Normally, the duration of examination is uh, three hours. And uh, if you get a uh, much higher percentile in the gate examination, you can also avail the junior research fellowship. Uh, for the integrated MTech PhD courses uh, in SESIR, uh, and we will we can uh, get the scholarship uh, for the first two years, twenty five thousand uh, plus HRA and agencies. And uh, further, if you are uh, completing successfully completing the two years, you will be uh, becoming a SARA uh, gate, and you will uh, be getting the uh, stipend twenty eight thousand per month. And uh, next competitive examination I need to discuss here is uh, CSIR net uh, eligibility. Uh, CSIR net. Normally, uh, uh, net you will see net is there, and CSIR net is there. UGC net is meant for the arts, arts formal subjects, and CSIR net for the science related subjects. And if you want to up, uh, appear for uh, CSIR examinations, you need to get minimum. 55, uh, 55 percentage of uh, mark in, in your graduate. Uh, and if you have, if you are belongs to uh, SCSP or uh, uh, categories, you, you will get a five percentage relaxation. And um, if you uh, 
if you uh, get much more percentages in uh, CSIR net examinations, you will be awarded a junior research fellowship also. But uh, there will be uh, age maximum age limit for getting to JR that is 28 years. And uh, there is also five years relaxation for SCSP and uh, uh, physically uh, disabled uh, candidates. And uh, there is no upper limit for appearing for the uh, CSIR net uh, examinations. So once you uh, clear this uh, net UBC examinations, you are eligible for uh, to get a job at the lectureship and assistant professor uh, post in uh, certain colleges. But uh, from this year onwards, uh, ministry MHRD has. Uh, 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 taken some decision that uh, uh, it's uh, you must have a PhD degree uh, for uh, uh, recruiting as a assistant professor in universities and uh, associate professor in colleges. Okay. Once you uh, clear the JRF, you must have enrolled in PhD positions uh, uh, within two years of uh, your. Uh, your award and uh, okay the pattern of the CSIR net examination normally uh, previously it was conducted by CSC nowadays uh, the examination is conducted by uh, NTA national uh, testing agency uh, which we uh, those who are conducting the G and uh, some examinations and CSR examination is uh, uh, it's included uh, included five uh, different major uh, subjects: physical science, chemical science, and mathematical science, and uh, life science and earth science. It will also be uh, in multiple choice type questions. And uh, CBT computer based uh, testing. Previously, it was descriptive and uh, manually we need to uh, appear, but nowadays it is CBT uh, examinations. There will uh, also be uh, ne negative marks for wrong answers, but the negative mark weightage will be different for different subjects. Okay, uh, this is all about my uh, today's talk about the. Uh, the research in India and uh, about the uh, uh, competitive examinations in the NK. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yasuddin. Um, now I think we can, as the speakers, uh, can unmute their uh, mic. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, uh, the first question is here What are the measuring skills that would a foreign university use in hiring their research scholars? Uh, I think uh, Dr. P.K. Sham can answer that. So even though he has mentioned the IELTS and TOEFL need to be cleared, but if somebody is, wants to crack that mission in a foreign university, what are the checklists he has to keep? I think that's what the question meant. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I assume to become a PhD scholar or PhD student or after PhD, if it is for PhD, uh, of course, the measuring scale will be what is the pre-experience in the, during the master level. Uh, I think for most of the abroad university, they don't care for the percentage of mark you scored in undergrad or in, in the master level. That's not very important. Of course, you should have a certain average score, like uh, 60, 70 percentage. But the most important thing is the what kind of research experience you have. And then uh, even if it's a very small scale, like in a factory visit or a lab visit and do some uh, small internship activities, and that really matter because that considered as a, a research experience. Why this? Because uh, as I mentioned in my talk, in uh, at least in the case of Japan and China, Korea, the master programs are mostly focused on research because I, I guide my master students who is working with me. So these students are in the lab all the day from morning to evening, they are doing solid research. They are master students and they go to occasional classes, credit-based classes that may be some 10 classes or 15 classes uh, throughout the year. 
all other time they are in the class and doing research. So when the university receive an applicant an application from abroad, from India, let's say, and if they don't ha have any kind of experience, it's pretty hard to get because they are going to compare uh, the application with the circumstance of Japan or Korea that uh, the students already have. So that's uh, prime important uh, to have the experience. And I think most of the universities measure the quality of applicant based on their research experience or related experience. I see. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think what you meant is uh, uh, before applying for the PhD, one has to have some research experience and maybe even publication can help, right? Of course, yeah. Uh, just to share with you, those applicants uh, coming to Japan from China, they actually mm -hmm. publish more than one paper. <laughs> and, oh, they okay. yes. and some students okay. even have three papers. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think in India, I don't, I don't know. I mean, during masters, uh, how many students publish a paper, even a paper? So one has to uh, think about that. How during master, how one can get some paper to uh, go uh, abroad for a uh, PhD. Yeah, we have another question. Yeah, uh, this question I think uh, Dr. Yasubin can answer. Uh, how do we go into research after master's? Basically, which exam do we need to qualify to go in for research? I think you mentioned about the net and gate. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think... Can I Probably, the, I, I, I don't know, maybe you can come and uh, something. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, in the talk itself, I have already told that uh, mm -hmm. you need to pass a uh, gate or net. Through these two examinations, we can end up to any institutions for pursuing the PhD or PhD. And uh, there are, uh, you, you can also join if you are working as assistant professor in any colleges or universities, you can do as part time uh, PhD. So uh, without uh, net and uh, gate, also you can do in some set, uh, some uh, certain universities uh, it's possible. But otherwise, uh, you need to uh, have uh, this gate or net or any other competitive examination which are conducted internally uh, by the universities. There are uh, universities uh, uh, examination departmental test for entering the PhD positions. Thank you. Uh... Uh, the next question uh, I see uh, uh, on the CV embassy, probably I think the Professor Abdul Samad can, I, I think he can answer this one since he's a uh, much senior and well experienced in the research field. The question is this, uh, anything special to be noted while making our CV impressive, whether we have to highlight our academic earnings or course, curricular activities, internship reports, I think it meant about the academic uh, CV, how one a good academic CV uh, can be uh, or ma made for the uh, the application. Uh, actually, uh, first you have to see where you are applying. If you are academic, applying for, let's say, research program or university job, so we we'll like to see your academic credential, your marks, your publications, but let's say if you are applying for industry, so in that case, maybe people will like to see your patent, industrial application. Uh, okay, uh, so, so you have to see where uh, you are applying. Now you are applying for my research laboratory, for example, an idea mattress. So I'll see whether you have relevant skill. If you have extracurricular activity, I don't care. I'll see whether you have good CGPA, you have good mathematical skill, simulation skill. So that should reflect in your biodata. But if I'm in industry, I'm hiring you. So I'll see whether you have industrial experience, you have patent, product development experience. Okay, so in that case, I will not be interested in your research uh, paper. Okay, now I think it will be clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't know that our uh, professor Rosalie is available. Uh, he is in yes. the session. Yes, I'm I mean, yeah, maybe you can comment on this one uh, for a, for a new research who wants to get into the research field. How to make a good profile, a CV? Okay. Uh, see, see. Normally, I mean, if you are looking at uh, higher educational institutions where 
uh, especially the prestigious ones around the world, um, you have uh, a, a surge of applications coming in every year. And, and I can tell you in the field of law, uh, publications do matter if you are actually going for higher research because higher research is essentially, they are testing your metal in regards to how well you can write and communicate because that's largely uh, whatever research you do. And in law, uh, we largely look at, you could do uh, analytical research or you could do empirical research. And today the most important thing is empirical research based on um, existing data. So empirical research, eventually you will have to publish. Uh, and what ways very highly in the top universities is your ability to publish. So if you have, as we heard, um, uh, uh, as we heard um, uh, uh, Professor Hashim say that that uh, the, the students from China already come with few publications, which is true in many of the foreign universities as well. So I would take, uh, I mean, if I'm looking at an application, uh, I would not look at the format or how well it is presented, because if there is an application, I would definitely read it. But more importantly, what is there in the application, which is also a point that Professor Abdul Samad that mentioned, it is the content that matters and, and not the way in which it is presented. And I say this consciously because we have instances where uh, we you have more than uh, thousands of applications for a, a particular uh, entry into a particular stream in a, uh, in, 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 a, in a top university. So how do they take a call on these thousand applications? And I can tell you that some of them have uh, have a, a format in which you have to send your CV. Now, in, in law, we have, uh, especially if you are applying for an academic post in the US, uh, they, your CV has to conform to a one-page format. It's, 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 it's a standard. It's a standardized format wherein you have columns. In each column, you're going to say what has to be said. Where was your last degree from? Number of publications, grade, CGPA. So what they do, because they get thousands of applications, they will just take the one page CV and which is a standardized format, which everybody has filled in the same format. They will look at their priority point. As Professor Abdul Samad said, if you are in the industry, you're going to look at application and research experience. If you are in academia, you're going to look at publication. So what they would do, depending on the expertise or, or on, on the specialization of the university, they're just going to look at column number three, column number six and column number seven. And if you don't fit into the bill, there goes your CV and your application. So, so what is important here, it is not, I mean, I, I, I'm just trying to make a point that in some places, the format doesn't matter. The style in which you write your CV, it simply doesn't matter. In fact, some, some uh, domains will ask you to confirm to their format. As I said, in law, if you're applying for an academic position in US, you have to draft a one-page CV in their format and everybody's CV looks the same. It becomes very easy. A standardized format helps them to look at the publication column, say it could be column number six. And if you don't have publication, they are simply not interested in it. So again, to emphasize, it is not the style or the presentation that matters. It is what you state in it, which means you should have done your part of the work in terms of getting experience or publications upfront. How you present it could be a matter of you know, it, 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 in, my, in my opinion, it's it, not the big thing. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe I can and add we, up, uh, one Oh, thing. yeah, sure. Uh, I think there is something called cover letter. So that make uh, some time important because most of the big professors working in universities or, or even companies, uh, like they don't read actually the CVs. They just look into the cover letter. Cover letter simply means the email content. So if you properly mention the, your achievement in a short phrase, in a limited number of sentence, and the word you list up, what you have, and then what's your ambition. That make, uh, I think, important steps to get not your CV. So in my experience, like uh, when I work with my professor, uh, who is a really big guy in the field and who published constantly science nature things. So he, Sometimes when I sit with him, he don't look into the CV. He just go through the, the maybe Professor after some of the also have the same experience. Like they just read the email and then the email is fine. Then download and check into the CV. So those who are uh, applying for especially a PhD program uh, outside the country, you need to make a proper cover letter. 
Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you so much for your yeah, time. I have one thing to say here. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, when you are writing email, the first email, first impression you are creating. So that time you don't do any mistake, grammatical mistake. Sentence will be must be properly structured. Even I also get lots of bio data, like post, sir, uh, especially after the corona, the job market is some problem. So many students writing one line email and grammatical structure not good, sentences are not proper. So immediately I delete them. Okay, if someone has written some good uh, paragraph and they have linked their work with my work, sir, you are doing this one. So that's why I want, I am applying here. I will get this benefit, you will get this benefit. So it's a win-win situation. So then I'll reply them quickly. Okay, I don't have fund or I have fund. Can you do this, this, this? Okay, right. so whenever you're applying, just you have to uh, customize your letter properly. Like directly hit Professor Tamad instead of Dear Sir. Okay. You hit the name. Okay, okay. you hit the Professor okay. Bhattacharya. You write the Professor Bhattacharya, not Dear Professor. Okay, and your profile I saw, you are doing on artificial intelligence on this specific area. You are, you, you, like Professor Firojali, if I am emailing, I will write, you are working on intellectual uh, property, right? I have invention. Can I work with you? Okay. okay. So yeah. you have to customize your letter like this. Okay. Yeah. So the first impression should be the lasting one. Uh, and we have uh, one question on this. Uh, in uh, which one would be better integrated uh, PG, PhD or PhD after completing PhD, PG? Uh, I think uh, any of you can comment on this one. Uh, this is um, since I came through, I did master then PhD. I never gone through the integrated PhD program. So I don't know which one to <laughs> uh, give a suggestion on that. If any of you have a comment on this, I would yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, I can say something. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. In, in IIT Metros, we have all these options, uh, integrated option, like these days uh, in IITs, uh, has given open up option, like master student can convert to PhD, BTEC student can convert to PhD. Uh, so in, in this case, it takes lesser time. Like you are doing MTEC program and you are converting to PhD or integrating. So total duration of it will be lower. Okay. Okay. But if you are doing separately, then maybe one year extra time you have to invest because in between transition, this writing will be there. Okay, I see. Time will be one factor. Okay. Yeah, in terms of research quality, I think. Uh, yeah, integrate also good actually sometime. Because if I find a good student, I will ask them, can you convert it? Okay, I see. <laughs> okay, so it will be beneficial for me because one student will be staying for maybe six months more. So they will be more beneficial for me. Okay. For a student yeah, also, sure. good, they'll get more publications. Okay. okay. In one, one go, it will be done. It will be done. Okay. okay. So with this, I think we have to conclude. Uh, it's already times of five minutes. Uh, we are uh, out of the session time. So with this, I thank everyone of this uh, the speaker who uh, has uh, given us a very, very precious time and a very informative and educative talk. And if uh, any of the participants has a uh, uh, the questions you can contact our organizers they will uh, connect to the speakers and you get the uh, good uh, proper guideline for the research field and with this uh, i conclude this session thank you so much everyone uh, the participants also assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wisdom students presents to the right goal through the right path let's profcon ProfCon, Professional Students Global Conference.